Hi, welcome back. Today we're going to get into chapter five of The Housekeeper's Diary by Wendy Berry. And the chapter actually opens up with Wendy saying that she's now been at High Grove for five whole months. Now there's a character I haven't introduced you to yet, but he has appeared earlier in the book and it's actually Paddy. Now, Paddy is an Irish man who is married to Nesta, and Nesta was the original housekeeper for Highgrove. Now, I think I did mention in an earlier episode that Nesta actually got cancer and she was unable to work because she just got too ill, and that's why Wendy Berry was actually employed. Now, understandably, Paddy was a little standoffish with Wendy Berry when she first arrived at Highgrove because she was taking the place of his ill wife, so you can understand. But he started to warm to her. At this point, around the five-month mark, he actually warmed to Wendy Berry and he used to follow her around while she was doing her work in the house and chat her ear off. He, she said that he had the Irish gift of the gab. Now, Paddy was really, really close to the then Prince Charles. Whenever Charles used to go out hunting, Paddy used to go out as a groom. They used to, when he was out in the garden, Paddy used to help him. He was sort of the outdoor guy. And during these outdoor activities, the then Prince Charles used to really confide in Paddy. So Wendy Berry makes the point that there was nothing that Paddy didn't know. He knew everything there was to know about the Wales's marriage. And she doesn't say he does, but she sort of implies that maybe um, Paddy would have told her a few juicy bits <laughs> while she was going around doing the housework. I'm sure that just made all the housework just fly by. Now, the marriage is getting really bad at this stage. Although they would still spend high grove weekends with the boys and they would put on a good front for the boys' sake, Wendy Berry noticed that they would arrive separately. Now, they used to arrive separately before for security reasons, but they would arrive within a short time of each other, but now it was hours and hours apart. Even sometimes the then Prince Charles would arrive a night early and then he would stay on for an extra night before going back to London. And Diana was often in tears. It was awful. There was always really bad arguments. And I'll just read you a little bit that I've taken out of this chapter. The children were often bewildered by all the commotion. And then she would just go on to describe that Diana, when she left, often she would be sobbing and crying so much that she couldn't even talk to say goodbye to the staff. She would sort of mouth goodbye because she was so upset. And then there'd be all these tears and everything out by the car. And then Charles would come running down really concerned and would um, apologize for making her cry and would kiss her on the cheek and would sort of try to make things better before she got in the car and try to to make sure that she was all right and usually she would get into the car still crying and she would put Harry on her lap and I'm thinking right there there you are there you have it there you have childhood trauma because what does that little toddler sees he sees the father apologizing so toddler's mind his fault then he sees mummy crying. Well, what toddler, especially what, I mean, I know when I was crying with my little boys, I, I didn't make a habit of it or anything. And it wasn't over arguments with my husband. But if ever you happen to cry in front of your lovely little boys, I mean, little toddler boys, they're so sweet, you know, if I bang my toe or something and it really hurt. And so they always want to try and make things better. And so putting Harry on her lap, that distressed, that would be bound to have a big impact on a little boy. And I'm not making excuses for him. I'm just saying it does inform us that you can see how he grew up to be so warped and twisted in his thinking because of the early childhood experiences that he had. Now, after one of these hoo-hahs, it was interesting that Wendy Berry, when all the staff uh, all walked back in, Paddy said to her, the sooner he gets rid of that one, the better. And she said that there was a few staff that heard him say that. And it was really interesting because everyone just went really quiet. They didn't engage him. And she said they didn't ever indulge in tittle tattle or gossip about the horror marriage. They were all incredibly loyal. And she does point out in this chapter that this family and the royal family by extension inspired incredible loyalty with their staff. They didn't betray them. 
I mean, often in the phone hacking and phone tapping days, the staff would be blamed because the newspapers used to cover up the, the fact that they were phone tapping and later on phone hacking by blaming the staff. But Wendy Berry says they were incredibly loyal and that the loyalty, now this is what she says, it's, it's not my opinion, it's just what she says in this book. She says that things changed though after Diana spoke to Andrew Morton. At that point, a lot of the staff loyalty was eroded and at that point, the gloves were off, to quote Ovid Scobie. Now, I said to you last video that uh, William actually had his first official engagement and it was leading up to Her Majesty, the late Majesty's 60th birthday, and there was going to be a Thanksgiving service and so William was going to appear, he was going to attend that service, and he was also going to ride in the carriage with our late Queen on the way back to the palace. This is a direct little snippet from the book. It was a time of high drama for young Prince William. Just a few months short of his fourth birthday, he was due to attend the Thanksgiving service at Windsor and ride back in the carriage with the Queen. William took the matter extremely seriously and rose to the occasion. He wanted to know over and over again exactly who was going to be there and what he was expected to do. And Baba, or Barbara, had told him just how important an event it was going to be. And she said he just loved the whole thing. He loved the attention. He loved the whole excitement of the whole thing, getting his hair especially trimmed and getting fitted for his clothes. So he wasn't traumatised by his first public appearance. He was very, very excited about it. And I think that is really a great credit to Barbara Barnes because she was the one in all reality that got him ready for this role. Now, before the official trip to Canada and Japan, Charles and Diana weren't even talking. And Wendy describes how they reacted really differently to the blazing rows. Charles would tend to go very formal and polite and sort of retreat inside himself. Whereas Diana used to get sort of really sort of aggressive and eyes blazing and stomp around and she would sulk for days. So they were two very, very different people. So you had Charles withdrawing and getting very stiff and formal and polite. <laughs> and Diana just letting it all hang out, baby. So in the summer months leading up to Sarah and Andrew's wedding, things did calm down a little bit. Diana used to be happier in the summer months because she would swim. She would get up every morning. Highgrove's got a beautiful pool. She would swim in the pool. Interestingly, she never swam with her husband. She would swim in the morning. He would swim in the late afternoons, evenings, and she, he would always encourage William and Harry to join him. Now, that's not necessarily a smear on Diana because maybe the boys weren't even up yet. She used to go very early in the morning for her swim and she used to do laps, whereas Charles used to go in there for pleasure and recreation and encourage the boys to join him and have a bit of horseplay and fun with them in the pool. Now, Charles also went off to Balmoral and left Wendy Berry with a brand new little Jack Russell puppy and um, it, she had to toilet train it and it weed all over Highgrove and it was just an extra stress that she didn't need. And that was the same little dog that I told you about in my video about Charles and Barbara Streisand. So it's interesting. This is when he was just a little puppy and hadn't been trained to go into beautiful women's bedrooms yet. Now, a very fraught time. Diana didn't want to go up to Balmoral. She couldn't stand Balmoral. She, she still actually got on quite well with the extended royal family, but she didn't like being stuck up in Scotland. She was a bit of a city girl. Um, and she used to, through these tears and tantrums and awful fights, she used to take it out on her dress, Evelyn. Now, evidently, Evelyn was really, really good at her job. And Wendy Berry said that Diana used to just be blatantly awful. Just used to call her into her room and just berate her for an hour and was just harsh and horrible. And, you know, people used to come to Wendy Berry concerned, complaining about the treatment and I, of course, it just pretty much didn't go anywhere. But she used to take her angst, her upset, 
I mean, this is the time where Diana's suffering from her eating disorder as well. All the staff were really, really aware of that. Um, a psychiatrist was called up to actually attend to her in Belmoral. So look, it's all just going from bad to worse. It's horrible. But one moving moment was when Paddy's wife actually died, Nesta. And interestingly, even though the then Prince Charles was his main friend, it was Diana that came back for the funeral. And Wendy Berry actually says this about it. And despite being aware of Paddy's feelings towards her, because Diana knew that Paddy didn't like her, Diana behaved with tremendous grace and sympathy. Her gentleness and genuine concern for Paddy was very touching. So all the staff thought that she was genuinely concerned and they were really touched with the way she cared for Paddy at the funeral of his wife. Now, then you've got the other extreme. So it's like a Jekyll and Hyde, the way she used to treat the staff and particularly her dresser. And then Wendy says, because she gets quite cross about the way Diana's treating this lovely woman, Evelyn, she says, the fact that Diana was so sweet and caring on the outside, which she was, and to the general public at large, was also sometimes capable of wounding sarcasm and spiteful mess, not only annoyed, but irritated me. And I imagine it would annoy and irritate you because when you can see how someone can behave impeccably when they want to, and then out of the public eye, you know, behaves in that manner, well, there's a level of control. I always think that too, that if someone can control themselves when they're under view and then they behave in a despicable manner when they're not, well, then... I don't really trust that person overly because that, that sort of illustrates that there is a level of control. They make a choice, you know. If you can behave well in some circumstances, well, there is a level of control there. The prince, meanwhile, was becoming a grumpy hermit and would try to arrange his travel to avoid having to return to Kensington Palace. So I'll finish off with this little bit. Uh, Wendy Berry says that at that year's Christmas party, uh, the prince's words of encouragement and thanks to the staff rang a little hollow to the very weary staff. So the staff were a bit full up with it. They weren't falling with the call to arms at the end of the year, the call to loyalty. Um, they weren't so willing to rededicate themselves after that year of hell. Now, I will be back. What are we up to? We're going to review 1987 and Chapter 6 next video. And this next video is titled Camilla. I'll see you then. Bye. Bye.